Nice to see you, Jimmy. Thanks for taking the time. My pleasure, Mike. Oh. <laughs> the nation knows you're fighting cancer. Yeah. Tell us uh, how you're feeling both physically and mentally. Yeah, look, I'm, I'm actually feeling really good at the moment. It's, 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 it's bizarre, as, as people would know, who've had it before. You, <clears throat> you know, you go through periods where you feel sick or nauseous or you feel really good or lethargic and often there's no reason, you don't know why, you just go through a period of it and, and I'm going through a good period at the moment. Now we'll get back to the illness later but uh, I do have an admission uh, that I've got to make to you. Yeah. When I first saw you in the mid 80s, running around for Melbourne in the number 37 Guernsey, I thought this guy's not going to make it. You went on to play 264 games and win a Brownlow medal. I'm officially sorry. Well, I would have to say that you probably, um, every year in my career, I reckon, I, you, were, you were telling me I wasn't going to make it at some <laughs> point. Um, and as I said, uh, you got me eventually. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but oh, look, I wasn't obviously a, a rockman that was what the game was used to seeing. And, uh, you know, you probably had a good reason. Now, Jimmy, there can't be an interview with you without reference to the 1987 preliminary final, Waverley Park, Hawthorne and Melbourne, and an Irishman unfamiliar with the rules ran through the mark and cost the Demons the game. What's your relationship like with John Northey? Yeah, good, really good. We, we had him at one of our games this year and uh, he coached, they had a team, you know, to, to pass players and corporate teams and he came along, but we get on, yeah, we get on good. You, you vividly remember the day, I know that, but the fiercest look on any coach's face, Ron Brassi included, was the look that John Northey gave you with his finger pointed at you in the rooms after the game. Yeah. Did you feel it going home to Dublin then? Yeah, look, he was devastated. He was, he was gutted. And look, back then it was fire and brimstone. That was the, the, the era. We were sort of coming towards the end of it. And he just couldn't believe it. He, he, he was just, he was lost in the moment. And for me, I was used to it. You know, my old man was just as bad, and I just went, "Oh well, that's that's life. You just cop it. You sit down, and and you, you just hope it all goes away." <laughs> you know. And as it turned out, when we left the dressing room, we ended up in the same lift, and I couldn't believe it. I was just like, <laughs> and he just looked at me and kind of half smiled and didn't say a word. And look, he's he's never apologised for what he said, but but he, didn't, he doesn't need to, you know, and. We, we, we got on with the business of playing footy, and, but he did, he did leave me with one piece of advice, and I'm, and I'm not sure if it was a before then or after that, but I'm pretty sure it was after, where he said, Jim, you don't ever want to have any regrets with your footy career. Just don't have any regrets. Because there's a lot of players that I've played with, and they just didn't train enough, or they retired too early, or whatever it may be, and they never got the second chance. Take us back to the mid 80s. You're a young man from Ireland in a foreign country trying to conquer a foreign game. Did you ever lose the faith? Oh look, it, it, it's interesting because I did, you know, in the second uh, year of my career, I was let go by Melbourne, I went to Paran. But there was something in me that just knew that I was good enough to make it. And I suppose I had a few people around me that had a bit of faith in me. I remember Chris Connolly and um, uh, Shane Zantok and you know at the time you know they would take me for a run you know we'd go for a lap in training at the start of training or whatever and I remember at that time in the middle of the season they said you know hang in there I reckon you know you, you, it'll, it'll come it's just the opportunities aren't there at the moment and you know and it, 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 I suppose it's just one of those things you either believe that or you don't and I really believed it and so I went down to Paran I really enjoyed my footy there and so when I came back for pre-season I was just much more prepared I, you know, I, was young, I was young, I was immature, I was, didn't have a lot of, you know, sl you know, a light frame and a lot of big guys around the club at the time. And today, the record to Jimmy Stein. You played an average of 22 games a year for 12 years. That suggests an extraordinary strength of both body and mind, and they're two qualities that are being sorely tested at the moment, aren't they? Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think the, the mind thing is, is really important for me. Like, I think of some people, that people say, oh, you know, you get real, like you're saying, I get real strength of mind. I say, look, I'm really lucky I've got it because I don't have to work as hard on that, whereas other people do. 
But it's like footy, you know, I wasn't as talented as some people, so I had to work much harder. Um, other people had the talent, but, what, but didn't work as hard, and so it balanced out. But, uh, you know, the, you still doubt yourself, though. You know, it doesn't matter how good or not good you are, there's still times where you are challenged and you have to remind yourself, and it's like motivation, you just gotta keep going back to the source and, and remind yourself and that uh, you can do it. Can you share with us how you felt when you first got the news, mid-2009, that you had melanoma? Uh, it was a shock. It just, it just, it was just like, that doesn't happen to me. <laughs> it's like, that's, a, that's very foreign. And, and then I thought, oh, no, I'll be right, it'll just be a lump. And they'll take it out and be, you know, it'll be a good story. And, you know, it'll, it'll uh, you know, the ego kicks in and goes, well, you know, you'll be, uh, you'll be able to say, yeah, you had cancer, but you, you get on with it and you beat it and all that sort of stuff. But um, when the doc then did the test and came back and said, no, we've got some more tumours lying around the body, then I was like, God, oh, this is really serious. You were on the front page uh, the following day, front pages of the papers. Has it been a negative or a positive to be fighting this battle in the public arena? It doesn't really phase me. You know, I've, I've, played, I've, I've played a game that's under the spotlight for 14 years and, you know, I've never really, I've never really had a problem with the media in any serious way. And I reckon if, if you know, the media have a job to do and, and I, I just figured you're better off having some sort of c control over it rather than trying to hide away. Mm -hmm. And because at the end of the way, at the end of the day, they probably find out anyway. And then you're better off giving your position rather than what they think the position is. Tell us about that day when you uh, announced your plight at a media conference, a packed media conference, and so sort of suddenly your illness became a public event. Oh, look, I was really shocked at the support and the attention I got from it. I just thought it was, it'd be the usual five or ten camp, you know, media people coming to, and it'd be somewhere on the back page and, you know, uh, but when I walked in there, like this room was, was packed and I was, it, it, that was a real surprise for me. But, um, but I look, again, I, I always look at the positives of, of those sort of things and, the, you know, the, the support I got from people and letters and cards and, and everything else was just awesome, you know, and, and you know, a lot of people live a very lonely um, uh, existence when they're sick, and um, particularly people when they get old, and, and that's when they get most of their ailments, and, uh, you know, I see it when I go into hospitals and, and people say, how are you doing, Jim? I go, good, how are you going? And, you know, 60, 70, 80 years of age, and they've got hardly anyone looking after them, and, you know, my wife will sit with some of them, and and find out their stories and it's just like, oh, that's, just break your heart, you know? Whereas I've got, these, I've got people supporting me all the time and I know it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. You know, that thought and prayer and, yep. and all that does make a difference and, you know. Are you a man of faith? Yeah, look, I am. I'm, you know, I've got my... You haven't I'm, got your scapula on, have you? Yeah, I actually do. Yeah. <laughs> you remember that? I do, yeah. from a long time ago, but yeah. I've got this green one here, most obviously people wouldn't know, but you know, a lot of people have given me little things this is that's the cleanest. That's the cleanest scapula I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, this is because uh, I haven't been wearing it long enough. <laughs> but uh, this St. Peregrine is the patron saint of cancer, and and then I got Mary, who seems to be in every one of my uh, everyone I know. It seems to have Mary in their name, and and so you know, Mother Mary, and my mum's name, and you know, uh, my daughter's middle name, and all that sort of stuff. But um, you know, and then I've got the cross as well, and I you know. I've got, Religion has been really, you know, w w has been a big part of my life, you know, since I was a kid, you know, going to church every week and, um, you know, and, and just having a lot of faith and praying for things that I've always wanted. And Do you find yourself praying more these days? Yeah, I do now. Mm. Yeah. Look, I, I did for a long time and then I, as I said, I just, it waned away and now I'm sort of bringing it back. And Do you ever ask the big fella, why me? Um, not so much why me, I, I suppose I go, part of me goes, this is ridiculous, like, how could this be? It, it, it's not more why, because I know it's just part of nature, you know? 
it's, it's just going to happen, you know. We're all susceptible to different things and when you get the balance out, then you're going to be, things are going to happen and an illness will come your way. And, uh, you know, I'm not blaming anyone. Don't blame, you know, the big fella. It's not, you know, it's, it's just, that's the way I see it. I just don't, I don't think that some people get it because they're bad or good or, or um, anything like that. There's no payback, it's just these things happen and then it's how you respond to them. What many of us find amazing is your ability to cope with your problems, undergo your treatment, be a husband and the father and still help run the Melbourne Footy Club. I mean, you've got an amazing appetite for, uh, for work. Yeah, it's, you, know, one of the, you know, one of the things that uh, I've probably learned from it all, you know, I've got to slow down and, and um, oh, you know, it's been the best thing in my life because I've slowed down and I'm more present. I spend more time with my kids, my wife. We're a lot closer. Um, you know, I, I don't sweat the, the small things like I used to. Like I was getting out of control. I was getting worse and worse. Not better and better. You know, my relationship with my wife is, is, is amazing. You know, and um, it was easy to, you know, take those things for granted. and. Um, which, you know, I was, so, um, yeah, and, 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 and there's no reason, you know, you don't have to do many things, you don't have to do more and more and more and more. It's just that my character is about ambition and drive and everything, but you can, you can do those things in other ways. Without. You mentioned purpose. Right now, what's the overriding purpose in your life? Well, my main purpose is my kids, my wife. Um, you know, that's the main thing. The other things are just, small, you know, they're, they're on the periphery, really. But I love making a difference. I love the work I do at Rach. I love what I'm, do what I'm doing with the footy club. Um, you know, I enjoy what I do in, in the business world. And, um, but main thing is my family. When, when the children talk to you about your illness, what do you say to them? Um, oh, they're pretty they're pretty good about it, you know. We, <laughs> I took my boy to a, I had to get a blood test at a clinic, and there was about ten people sitting around, and he sat up next to me and he looked at me. and He said, "Have all these people got cancer?" Then <laughs> and it was really. Loud. I was like, Shh. No, I don't think so. No, really, really. Have they all got cancer? And chances are, none of them probably did. But they saw your hair fall out. Now, I mean, for kids, that's a visible sign that something's wrong with daddy. What? Yeah, but I didn't have to. It didn't have to fall out for them to know it was going to fall out, like I was telling them beforehand, mm -hmm. this is what's going to happen. And, and um, you know, and after I had my hair, I didn't fall out, well, I, we shaved it out. <laughs> and then my little boy wanted to shave his hair. <laughs> he wanted to be like that. Let's talk about Reach and your involvement with young Australians who may have lost their way. How did you become involved with that? Um, I probably going back to when I used to go away in the summertime in Ireland. I go to these summer camps. They were kind of we actually there were, there were boarding sort of um, schools, and we learned about Ireland and our, all the Irish culture, our language. Well, you had to speak in, in your language, and, and you'd learn about your song and your dance and and so on. And down there, I just when I went down there, I didn't have any love of the language and all that. I didn't see any purpose in it because we, 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 we spoke English. But the guy who set it up, it was, it was, we went there for school to get better grades. But he wanted us to become great leaders and passionate about our country and understand, and understand when we did leave, if we ever left our country, we understood what we, what we were all about. And uh, I was amazed by that. I, was really, I really looked up to him. As a, as, a, as, a, as a figure that, um, and, um, and also, you know, he was pa so passionate about a cause that I had, didn't understand. And because um, we were all wanting to get better grades, but he didn't really care about the grades. He wanted us something much bigger than that. And, um, you know, after going back year after year, I just, I could just, I was learning something was happening in me. I was becoming very passionate about life. And, um, going after the things that I wanted. So it made it easy to go to Australia and go after what I wanted. And so, you know, when I came here and 
started getting opportunities to hang out with kids and be through footy and so on. It was always the bit near the end where we'd get to talk, sit around and they'd ask questions. I'd always say to them, don't ask me the questions that are in the footy records and how many goals you kicked and all that. Tell me things that can help you as a kid. It'll help you on your journey, your career, your football, whatever. I used to love it. And then I got a, then, you know, it, it happened, it just morphed into, you know, I'd love to set up a camp where kids could take this passion they have for sport and take it into life. And um, we did, we took away a hundred kids from all walks of life, you know, private school, public school. And um, I actually remember Gary Senior coming down as one of the sports guys to come and talk to the kids. And he brought Gary Junior with him. And um, that was the first time I got to know him. And, you know, all the kids, then we had a game and he's, he was younger than most of the kids, but gee, he could, he could get the ball in a pack. He was like nine and all the kids were like 12 to 15. And it was amazing and I was, but that period started it for me. You know, I, I could see that there was things missing in these kids' lives and um, we needed to unlock it. And uh, I had a guy come down one night, he was a drama coach and he ran this workshop and it just blew the kids away. They were just amazed. And so when they uh, woke up the next morning, they just, they were changed kids. They were talking to kids they wouldn't normally hang out with. They were, um, instead of, you know, picking on each other and being in their little cliques and all that sort of stuff, they just stopped all that. They stopped hanging it on each other. You know, the judgment just went out the window. It was great. And then I knew this is where the kids need to wor work from. And, um, you know, and, and they needed to then work on their past and work on their faults and their imperfections and not be afraid to explore that side of themselves. And um, so with Paul, we started running workshops during the evening and Reach was sort of born. Let's talk about your footy club. Mm. A lot of expectation and excitement about 2010. What do you think it's going to bring? Look, Look, we're still on the journey, you know, we've spent the last couple of years just trying to uh, you know, get the place in order, really settle it all down, find out what's really going on, stabilise the, the place. And now it's about getting back in the game and becoming competitive again. You know, we're not expecting finals, uh, we're not expecting miracles at the moment, but we've got a great talented bunch of, of young players and we've got to train them properly. We've got to bring them through, build strong bodies, build strong minds, and we can't try and fast, fast track it. We've got to be really careful with that. And, but the thing I love about it is there's so many of them all coming in in the same sort of three, four year period, that they're going to be great mates, they're going to understand each other, they're going to be able to play, a dynamic, like the forward line will be totally different in, in two, three years time than what it is has been the last couple of years. And they'll start to get to know each other over those, year, those couple of years. Same with the back line, midfield. So there's going to be a lot of excitement. Our supporters are going to see new kids coming out of their shell. Like kids like Frawley, who came out this year. Like he's a man now. You know, a year ago they were all getting into him because he couldn't kick. Mm. Now he's taking on Favola and Rewalt and all these premier players and holding them, you know, holding them goalless till you know, after half time or till you know, the, no, you know it, it, and you can see he's, he's a different player. Dean Bailey's future? Um, look, uh, I, I've been really happy the way Dean's gone about business, you know, the last couple of years, like we did in the point. And, but I think he's been able to handle a really difficult situation. You know, he hasn't had um, the kids on the park, he just hasn't had them. And I think he's, he's dealt with, he's been very resilient and he's dealt with media and and, uh, and what's been thrown at him. What do you say to those of us who occasionally accuse Melbourne of uh, tanking games last year? Uh, well, I was sick. I was in <laughs> hospital for most of us. <laughs> when they were accusing. Um, look, it's, uh, I just think that the way the system is, it makes it very difficult to be sitting there as a supporter, wanting to win, but wanting to lose because there's more at stake if you lose than if you win. And um, I just think the way the system is, it's just made it really difficult for people. But are you sitting here telling me that Melbourne tried to win every game it played in 2009? 
Oh yeah, look, we, of course we were. We were trying to win win games, but we were also trying to develop young players. And we had, you know, and this this is why people will question about tanking. And it depends on what you mean by it. You know, if you mean you've you're not playing a player who's about to retire because you've got another player who it needs needs game time to develop, but he's not as good as the player that's been dropped. What do you do? And Robbo was a classic case. You know, in one team he'd be playing another season. With, with us, we can't afford to leave him in there because we've got to develop a whole new forward line. So, is that tanking? All now, right, I'll, I'll get. I would say it's not because that's you've got to manage your players, and you're you, you've got to. We're, we're about creating a future. We've got a, a certain plan, and we're not going to be sidetracked by that. When you get one last, one specific, yeah. were you barracking for Melbourne against Richmond mm. when Jordan McMahon had the ball in his hands at the final siren? I think I was in hospital then. <laughs> <laughs> I might have been. It's long! The Tigers in a thriller! You won four best and first, which is uh, a joint record at Melbourne. You won a Brownlow medal. You're a Victorian of the year. And you're in the Hall of Fame. Does one of those achievements stand above the rest? Um, oh, look, obviously, because I didn't win a premiership, the, the, you know, the Brownlow was, was clearly the, the highlight of my footy career. You know, it was totally unexpected, not something I ever thought had ever happened. You know, I was still understanding the game, and here I was in the middle of a room with all these people that I admired for, since I'd been here. And, you know, I'm looking out at them, not the other way around. It was it was a surreal moment, absolutely surreal. And then, you know, and then you feel a real part of the the game. You know, you you really you get it because you, you realise that you're part of history now, mm -hmm. and um, you have a, a responsibility. You know, you you don't just come into the game, play, and then you disappear like many players do. But when you achieve something like that, you, you become part of the game, part of the club, the competition, the game. Is it a strike you that's incongruous that we've got an Irishman who's the president of Australia's oldest footy club? It, it, it is the weirdest, weirdest thing out of it because I never thought I'd get involved in the politics of footy or the, you know, the management and, of football. I was always... You know, and the previous five, four years, I'd step right back. You know, I was involved in supporting Neil Danaher in a, in a coach, supporting coach role, and then I made the decision to get away from it all so I could be with the kids and go away in the middle of footy season and all that. But it wasn't until I saw that we had a really sick club that someone needed to get in there and do something. And, you know, I was trying to help other players. You know, I said, oh, let's get a few players together and, that was before we realised how sick it was, and we said, look, let's do something. You told the, uh, a reporter from the Herald Sun at Christmas time, just gone, that your wish was that you would see Christmas 2010. Yeah. Is that still the focus? Yeah, well, he asked me what my uh, New Year's, you know, resolution, wish, whatever it would be, and I said, well, um, to be still here next year. Very simple. Um, and, uh, you know, life is very simple now. And when I'm wondering, should I do this, shouldn't I do this? I don't do it. I don't have to anymore. We used to feel obliged all the time. And then I'd feel bad if I didn't. And I think it's just time that, you know, I, I, I suppose it's, it's time that I can be selfish now. Or I can be non-committal. And, um, but also what I've noticed is people have really taken a step up. I've, and I've actually allowed them to take a step, like at reach, I've allowed people to, uh, to really own the organisation. Whereas I was getting in the way, I was sort of owning it too much, if you know what I mean. So now the young people who've come up the ranks and they're now running so much of it, they're running it all. And I can now come in and give them a little bit of support, like a, a mentoring role rather than dictating and and, and owning it. And it's the same with, with the footy club. These people, are, like everyone around the club now, are really owning it and making the decisions. And, and I'm just, 
you know, supporting it like everyone else. Despite my early reservations, you were a great player. You are truly a great Australian and a true humanitarian, and we wish you all the best for the future, Jimmy. Thanks, mate. Thanks, Jimmy. Thank you. I thought you were going to say, but I, I, I didn't have faith in you as, a, as an administrator. Well, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, I've conceded. <laughs> Good work. This has been a Fox Sports presentation.